good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. Um, I'm your moderator for today's webinar, Joe Ackerman out of Washington University in St. Louis. And good I'm- Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. Um, moderator for today's webinar, Joe Ackerman out of Washington University in St. Louis. And I'm only going to go back to the room of the evening and the city wall. Moderate today's webinar, just a little on the block. Hopefully that. <laughs> Hopefully that. We're still getting sound. Um, I'm going to just continue along as if I don't care. <laughs> um, I remind you that the um, late breaking abstract. Abstract session is open. Um, Hopefully that we're still getting sound. Um, I'm gonna just continue along as if I don't care. <laughs> late breaking abstract. Um, late breaking abstract session is open. Um, Hopefully that. Still getting sound. Um, okay. All right. I have no idea because I've been hiding the live stream. Um, remind you that you have a webinar coming up May 23rd. Um, late breaking session open. Shouldn't be in hiding the stream. I don't know what. I, know I, I have no idea because I've been hiding the live stream. I uh, remind you that you have a webinar. There we go. I just canceled the live stream. Um, at any rate, um, May 23rd, Tom Yankalov is speaking. Your moderator will be Koresh Shogi. Um, and I remind you this webinar is coming from the Image Data Science Group of the WMIS. Um, this Data Group advances the application of data science across all research domains of interest to members of the WMIS. And I encourage you, if you're not a member, to sign up um, and you'll get access to uh, many very interesting uh, webinars such as this. Um, Charlie Springer has been a fixture in the MR business for a long time. Um, and if you care to read the, the words here, you'll see he's had uh, an enormous impact on the MR field um, all the way from, well, almost the very beginning uh, up till today. He, it says here he's had over 50 years of experience uh, in MR science. Um, I think he's been in the field uh, a lot longer than that. Um, and I thought what we would do, instead of my reading about uh, all his accomplishments, um, is I enlisted the help of uh, Mr. Peabody and Sherman. Uh, Mr. Peabody, as some of you know, you the older ones, uh, is an extremely intelligent talking dog. Um, he was actually a data scientist at one time. <laughs> I mean, he invented the Wayback Machine. Um, which allows you to go back in time and look at historical events. Um, and you see here, um, Sherman, who is Mr. Um, Peabody's pet boy, says, where are we going this time, Mr. Peabody? And Mr. Peabody says, set the Wayback Machine to the first MR conference Charlie attended. And there it is. There's Charlie at his first MR conference back in the Jurassic era. So I just want you all to know that this is a great scientist. He's been around a long time and he was very lucky as you can see to survive this first uh, MR conference. 
So Charlie, I'm going to leave it to you. I'm going to stop sharing and away you go. Thank you very much, Joe. Let me share my screen. Oh, I, you have to let me. Somehow you're not letting me share a screen. I'm trying to. Hold on. But I did, and I thought I went down here. Okay, I did it. You got it? Yeah. Okay. So you can see uh, my screen now, the yes. title. Great. Okay. Well, thank you for that introduction, Joe. That's that's uh, that stretches the truth a little bit, but I really appreciate it, <laughs> and I really uh, enjoyed uh, and appreciate the invitation to talk. So let me uh, get into presenter mode here. I want to tell you about some recent uh, work we're doing um, to do metabolic activity imaging at uh, high, high spatial resolution. Um, and um, so I'll start with uh, the first slide. This, this year in, in the upper left, we see a, a, an anatomical 70 uh, MRI. This year is the 50th anniversary of the birthday of uh, MRI. And of course, in, in the clinic and in human imaging, it's almost exclusively used uh, for anatomical Im uh, imaging at exquisite resolutions. Uh, here you can see a nominal voxel size that's about the size of a poppy seed. Um, but in the, the 50 years uh, that MRI has existed, people have forever all of that time been trying to also uh, obtain and map metabolic information. And here are a couple of metabolic spectroscopic images of a sodium image of the brain and, a, and an ATP phosphorus 31 image of the brain. And of course, they suffer from uh, poor resolution because the signals uh, are weaker. Uh, what they give you is uh, a measure of the metabolite concentration. So they're really related to the thermodynamics of metabolism. But at the same time, there are methods that want to measure metabolic activity or map metabolic activity, which is telling you about kinetics of metabolism. And here is a PET, uh, an FDG PET image. And FDB, FDG PET is almost 50 years old itself. And a hyperpolarized uh, carbon-13 uh, image uh, of a glioma. And um, so the, the essences of these are that they give you a beautiful information, but they have some issues that could be improved upon. First of all, they yield tissue concentrations or the metabolic activity images use tissue kinetics. And the two major methods, uh, FDG PET and hyperpolarized carbon-13, entail pharmacodynamic model analysis. In other words, you have to inject uh, an agent to do these and you get non-steady state kinetics. And of course, um, they suffer resolution, uh, poor resolution compared to the water proton. So what we're interested in is, is to see whether we can get the same kind of information uh, about metabolism uh, with water proton approaching the, the high resolution that you can get with water proton. And you, just as an example, you can see that in, in the brain, um, the tissue concentration of sodium is greater in gray matter than in white matter, but the tissue concentration of ATP is greater in white matter than in gray matter. There's often that kind of complementarity or that kind of relationship between sodium and, and phosphorus. And that begins to give us a clue as to how we might do this, um, this uh, um, MADI metabolic activity diffusion image. 
And here is this magical enzyme, sodium potassium ATPase or NKA, that couples the hydrolysis of ATP to the extrusion of sodium from the cell. So it, it's a, an enzyme that couples ATP concentration with sodium concentration. And, it, and, and I'll elaborate on this a little bit in, in a while. Um, this is really a phenomenal enzyme. It can tell the difference between sodium and potassium, which is chemically very difficult. And it excludes sodium from the cells and concentrates potassium. And there are people who work on the evolution of life who think that their first cells evolved in volcanic uh, fluids that were rich in potassium. And that's why the machinery of cells developed uh, with a lot of potassium ions around. But when, in the, when the cells wanted to go out in the world and proliferate, they went into the sea which is rich in sodium. And so the development and evolution of this sodium potassium pump um, was crucial to the evolution of life. And it's been studied ad infinitum in vitro on the bench. There are many different conformational states involved in this thing, worlds around through these states, uh, expressing three sodium ions to the outside and two potassium ions to the inside every time an ATP is hydrolyzed. Here is a recent crystal structure of the sodium potassium pump in KA. It's a large protein with many subunits. And in this particular case, the investigators had crystallized the form of it with the natural product inhibitor Wabane jammed into the hydrophilic channel, which runs through the protein. This is the outside, this is the inside of the cell. And you can see the Wabane lodged in the channel. And you can see two potassium ions bound to a binding sites near the cytoplasmic mouth or the inside mouth of the channel. Uh, so we know a lot about it uh, in, in particular, but it's been very hard, and I'll show you why, to measure its ongoing activity in vivo. Here's a wonderful cartoon from a cover of Science a couple of years ago that depicts the sodium potassium pump as the light bulb of the cell being driven by energy by, from the mitochondrion. And so it would be really nice if we could do some imaging that told us how bright is the light bulb burning or how dim is the light bulb under different conditions. And uh, the reason it's been um, almost impossible to, impossible to measure in vivo is that it doesn't work alone. Here's the sodium potassium pump again with this rectangle, and it's pumping sodium ions out as you hydrolyze ATP. But there are lots and lots of transporters uh, by which sodium ions can re-enter the cell. And so they're really just cycling around and the same is true for potassium. It's, pump, it's bringing potassium ions into the cell, but there are transporters by which potassium can leave the cell. And so it's whirring around very, very fast. It's in homeostasis. There, there's no net change, observable change going on. So you couldn't use microelectrodes to try to measure how fast this is running because there's no current. Um, but over the last uh, about 11 years, we have done a number of experiments where we were trying to measure the rate constant for how fast water comes out of a cell, KIO, a very important parameter. And we were doing manipulations on varying the concentration of intracellular ATP, adding Wabane on the outside, or titrating with potassium at low concentrations or high concentrations. And we began to notice that the KIO changed and behaved as if it was being driven in sync uh, with the sodium potassium pump. And just here's the very first example that Jim Balshai made in 2011 with yeast cells. 
and he could show that the KIO for the water efflux rate constant varied with the intracellular ATP concentration, got very low when there was not much ATP and higher when there was more ATP. Here's a more recent experiment I did with Peter Basser and Ruling Bai, where we were studying a perfused or superfused rat uh, cortex. Uh, and, and we did a, an extracellular potassium titration. And so we could titrate with extracellular potassium and see that the water exchange rate constant followed a michaelis menten uh, uh, relationship with a K KM value similar to what you would expect for the sodium potassium pump. We could also see that the, the cortex, which was uh, neuronally firing, uh, the firing rate changed when you titrated with potassium, as you expect. If you do low potassiums, KIO gets bigger. If you go to too high a concentration, it goes down. I'll show you why in a minute. And we found this 30-year-old paper where people had been studying isolated rat brain synaptosomes uh, in a chamber that where they could measure the oxygen uptake. And they did an extracellular potassium uh, titration. And they see it, a curve of almost exactly the same shape as our curve. In fact, if I just take our curve and their data and, and plot them together, they're very highly correlated. It says as extracellular potassium increases uh, up to a point, the KIO increases and the, the water exchange is getting faster. Well, this was quite strong evidence that the pump is involved and now there have been like 20 other type experiments. The explanation is that the pump, the, the sodium potassium uh, pump, which I symbolize with this circle, is being driven by ATP. And if you titrate with extracellular potassium, you can make it go faster because it's, it's bringing potassium into the cells. Uh, and, and the water exchange seems to go fast. This is the water exchange. And their experiment was if they titrate with extracellular potassium in a chamber that can measure the oxygen uptake to the mitochondrion, um, the same thing happened, that, that the whole process runs faster. And so we, we were finding that with water proton MRI measurement of water exchange, we were seemingly measuring something related to the metabolic rate at which the pump was running. And that's pretty interesting and, and um, uh, very potentially useful. So a question is, wh what's going on? How is that that it's happening? And I've showed you a lot of, lot of other transporters here. And, and it's, it's happening because the pump activity is coupled to the activity of all these other transporters. And let me try to, to show you that. Here is a slide of the kind of con uh, contemporary list of water transporters across membranes. And there are many of them, and I'd, pretty, uh, I'd be sure there are many more that haven't yet been studied. Uh, this uh, Th Thomas Zoyton in Copenhagen has done a lot of this work, and he was measuring, overexpressing these transporters in model systems and doing induced unidirectional fluxes. And you can see that these include some very important transporters. Here are the glucose uptake transporters that require sodium as a codependent, the sodium glucose co-transporter. Here's a family of glucose transporters that don't require sodium. Here is a transporter for glutamate, the primary excitatory neurotransmitter that requires sodium to get into the cell, and GABA, the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter to get into the cell. And uh, here's the, the lactate exporter, which you want to get lactate out of the cell. Um, and what Zoytin noticed that each of these 
some of them had very huge stoichiometries of water that were co-transported with the substrate. Now, you should take those to be mean stoichiometries. I'll show you um, that they're, they're likely, they vary from shot to shot, but he did very careful experiments and these are kind of the average and they're humongous amounts of water. And of course, in the late 80s, uh, Agre um, uh, and his group discovered the aquaporins, uh, which just transport water by itself without any other substrate. So there are a lot of transporters. I'm sure there are many, many more than this. And we ought to try to have a sense of how they work molecularly, which is not an easy thing to do, but you can get at this with this technique of molecular dynamics where you simulate the, the behavior using a crystal structure. And this group at UCSF um, chose a sodium dependent galactose transporter I had to remind myself that galactose is a stereoisomer of glucose, um, and, and, but it's a sodium codependent uh, galactose transfer. And here's the crystal structure they use. Uh, in this case, this is the outside uh, 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 of the uh, uh, cell, and this is the inside. And here is the sugar stuck in its binding site through the hydrophilic channel, it's somewhere in here. And here is a sodium ion bound at the cytoplasmic mouth of the channel. And then they ran these simulations with thousands of water molecules. Um, and here are two plots of what they find uh, running out to about 200 nanoseconds. It's very expensive computationally to do molecular dynamics. And if this sodium ion releases, at this point, about 10 uh, nanoseconds, the, a period starts whereby there is water exchange. There's water, they could, since they're doing a simulation, they can keep track of individual water molecules and whether they're extracellular or intracellular. And you can see that there is a period of some 80 or so nanoseconds where it's basically waters are going in and out. Once the sodium is gone, waters are going in and out, running past the sugar. The sugar is still there. And it's at a really decent rate, uh, about two molecules for every nanosecond, more or less going, both, one going one way the same amount as the other. It's a bi-directional steady state exchange period. But then once the sugar releases at about 90 uh, nanoseconds, the sugar acts like a piston and pushes a large amount of whatever water is left in the channel. And this is kind of what Zoithin was measuring in these one-way transports. Uh, the amount of sugar inside is negative here, uh, uh, water after the galactose re release. So you can get a sense of how these work. Here's another molecular dynamics uh, simulation by a group at Illinois of the same transporter with no sodium. And they must have had more money. They could run out to a thousand uh, nanoseconds, uh, five times longer. And in this case, what they found was the sugar never did release. The sodium was already gone. And what they saw were these periods of exchange uh, equal amounts of water going each way, but they're like spasmodic. They're spasms of, of, of water exchange. And here's a picture of what's happening. The, there's a twisting motion uh, of the channel and it closes off periodically. And so you get these periods of water uh, ex exchange in this case with no net water input. And the, the point is, that it's the release of the sodium that triggers all of this. And so who controls the probability of how often a sodium is bound on the inside is the sodium and potassium pump because it controls the intracellular sodium concentration. The higher the concentration, the uh, longer the periods are where the sodium is bound. 
the lower the sodium concentration when the pump is running faster, there are more periods where, the, where there's no sodium. And so you can begin to see how these things are all coupled to the activity of, of the pump. And so that's what uh, this complicated drawing I've showed you before is trying to show. Here's the sodium glucose transporter. It shares a, a, a sodium with the pump, but it also has a water. And so if you have common substrates, then transporters are coupled together but water is also involved. Here's an exporter KCC4, which has potassium as a substrate, but also water as a substrate. So you can begin to see how these are coupled. And in fact, the whole system, even though I'm talking about one-way influxes and one-way outfluxes, effluxes, they're all coupled to be in homeostasis. The whole cell is not swelling or shrinking. And uh, the rate laws for, for this homeostasis is that, for example, uh, the sodium e efflux, uh, uh, let's look at the sodium um, influx reaction is three times the rate of the pump. The potassium efflux reaction is two times the rate of the pump. And the water influx is x times uh, the rate of the pump because x is the stoichiometry of the water. And I'll show you later, this is a very large number. So the point is, everything is in homeostasis. Everything is in steady state. The rates are not equal to the pump, but they're synchronized with the pump. When the pump goes faster, they all go faster. When it goes slower, they all go slower. And so we developed this equation that says KIO, the rate constant for water efflux, has, is dependent on the metabolic rate of the pump, how fast it's running. All of these experiments that led up to this discovery of what we call active water cycling uh, used contrast agents in the outside space uh, in the extracellular space to increase the shutter speed to allow you to measure uh, this rate constant uh, with accuracy. And there are like more than 20 experiments that kind of all support this general picture. However, when you want to go in vivo, there are some difficulties in using the shutter speed approach that we've elaborated the shutter speed concept and the shutter speed laws uh, in papers. Uh, but the, the problem, and all the work was done on model systems where you can do really careful work. In vivo, uh, the problem is that the extracellular fraction of water is very small. And that means the rate constant for water influx, KOI, is very large. And the shutter speed has to cover, has to be equal to the sum of the influx and the uh, uh, efflux and influx rate constants. And so that can means that the shutter speed may have to be like five times the uh, efflux rate constant. At the same time, you can't control your shutter speed concentration very well at all. And it's typically small and doesn't last very long. And so there's a real difficulty in doing this in vivo. And a third and important property is if you use the shutter speed approach, you can't uh, separate, you, you can uh, determine the intracellular volume fraction, but you can't separate the cell density from the average cell volume. And that turns out to be really quite important. And here, this is just an arrow to show you that if you're working in vivo, you're counting on getting the contrast agent out of the blood, uh, but you can't control this concentration very well. And it's very transient. It, it comes in with a rate constant and then it eliminates with a rate constant. And so 
it's difficult to use the shutter speed in, in vivo, although we tried for more than 10 years uh, to do that. So we decided to look for a way that didn't really require a, sh a shift reagent approach and, and was totally non-invasive. And we finally settled on diffusion MRI, which you all know is a tremendously prolific field. Uh, here in 2011, there were uh, more than 3,000 papers a year, widely used in, in clinical imaging, a lot of it for in qualitative ways. There are quantitative studies that do uh, track tracing and uh, microanatomy uh, characterization or microstructure. Um, but there are a lot of uh, uh, many, many different uses in clinical medicine that are very qualitative. And there have been some thoughtful expressions of, well, you know, maybe we don't really have the clearest possible understanding of what are the underlying mechanism of diffusion of water and tissue. So we decided to try to get after that issue. And we, we call it metabolic activity diffusion imaging or MADI. It's totally non-invasive. We don't inject anything. It's a primitively simple model. It's avascular, it's isotropic. We use the pure water diffusion coefficient for the water in the compartments. It ignores the morphology of the cell and it doesn't use the shutter speed. And it has three, the, the scientific premise is that there are three um, um, or hypothesis. There are three fundamental unfactorable tissue biology properties that are sufficient. The mean volume of the cells, um, which is a very important quantity in its own right, like this is in vivo cytometry, the density of cells, that is the, the number density, how many cells are there per unit volume, and the mean value of this KIO rate constant. Uh, and we, we posit that these are sufficient to describe a diffusion signals. Well, we, so we're going to do Monte Carlo simulations on, on a, in a virtual tissue. And many of those have been done on identical spheres, but you can't use identical spheres for this purpose because the intracellular volume fraction cannot be greater than 0.74. And it's been measured to be 0.8 and 0.9 in some tissue. And also you can get diffraction effects in diffusion and MR if you use identical spheres. So we decided to use the contracted Veroni cells, which, are, which allow you to do stochastic geometry. You can make an ensemble, this ensemble, um, this particular picture has about 19,000 cells in it, uh, but they're all different shapes and sizes. And you can make another one with the same number of cells, but as in all the other same properties, but they will be different uh, shapes and sizes of the cells. And in this particular ensemble, there's about 100,000 cells per microliter. Uh, the average cell volume is about 5.6 picoliters, and the gaps between the cells are four microns. This is about one eighth of a typical high resolution MRI voxel. And so we do Monte Carlo simulations in these ensembles, and you can see a water molecule starting inside a cell and then getting outside the cell. And of course, we, it's a standard Monte Carlo. It, it develops phase uh, depending on the, the diffusion, the, the projection onto the diffusion encoding uh, uh, gradient. And um, we, um, we determine KIO, the rate constant for the water coming out, by the probability of permeating the membrane when it encounters it, P sub P. And so that's very important because the, the, the water diffusion coefficient on each side of the membrane is the same, it's pure water. So there's no shutter speed at all. 
uh, but we get the, uh, uh, and everything is in homeostasis, uh, there's a, a water coming in and out. And you should notice, it's very important, I won't have time to really focus on it, uh, you get well-mixed conditions, and a well-mixed condition means a water molecule hits a membrane many, many times before it leaves the cell. And, and that turns out to be really important. So we decided to simulate uh, uh, diffusion decays, that is the log of the transverse signal over S0 as a function of this diffusion parameter B. And we made a library of simulated decays. Uh, the current library has over 14,000 entries. Each decay re required about 12 million random walks in different ensembles, typically of 160,000 cells, with the same KIO rho and B value. It's about 15 CPU hours per entry. So we use a supercomputer with a lot of parallelism so that we, we don't have to wait so long and, and, and pay so much money. So we have a, a library with about 15,000 entries and every 200th of them is shown as a gray decay here. And they, these cover all of B space because this is pure water, um, these, this black line, and this is no diffusion up here. So this is all of B space and the library covers it. Um, and inside the library, there are um, 64 different KIO values, 131 different row values, 246 different B values. And then I show you some experimental data from murine colorectal cancer, the, the points, um, human prostate lesion, a normal appearing part of the same prostate. A these are all single voxel decays, single diffusion weighted voxel decays in the human brain gray matter and in the bladder, which is essentially pure water. And the colored uh, curves are, are members of the library that actually match uh, the experimental data. And so this is the way we proceed to analyze it. And an important point about these, these parameters is you can, these are real tissue properties, the cell density, the average cell volume. You can appeal to histology to try to validate what you're measuring. These are not empirical or arbitrary parameters. They are real things. And we published this table earlier this year. And if I gave you time to read it, you could see that, that, that the values we get from the matching uh, with the library, are there are good uh, uh, validations from independent in vitro or ex vivo measures. Here's a picture of the library uh, in Cartesian space, just to give you a sense. Uh, here is the KIO direction increasing this way. And in fact, uh, here is the uh, average cell volume uh, axis increasing this way from zero to eight picoliters. Uh, here is the cell density from zero to 16, uh, 100,000 cells per microliter or 1.6 cells per microliter. And here is the KIO axis in reciprocal seconds. And the KIO for pure water is undefined. This would be pure water with no cells and no volume. And it's undefined and it's positive infinity. So it's up here. And you see that there is a section of this uh, space which is empty, not because we didn't want to put any uh, entries there, it's a forbidden area. It's when the intracellular volume fraction is greater than one. And the intracellular volume fraction is the product of our two fundamental parameters, V and rho. And so you, in this particular picture, there's about uh, 7,500 entries that are within the biologically relevant parameters of the library. So this is about half of the total library. And each one of these little, 
you, it's hard to see their little tiny dots or circles. Each one of them represents one of these 12 million random walk simulated decay. This is one for parameters that turn out to be typical of brain gray matter. And so it's located in this particular region of the library. This is one with parameters that are representative of brain white matter. And it's located in this part of the library. And you can already see from this that we should be getting pretty good uh, gray and white uh, discrimination because they're in different parts of the library. Well, in order to test the inverse problem, how unique are the matchings, we send, so, so we take a, this is a T1 weighted image of a brain, but there's also a diffusion weighted image of that brain. And it has about 20,000 voxels in that slice. It's a 3D whole brain acquisition. It's just one slice. Each of those 20,000 DWI voxel decays are compared with all of the library entries non-iteratively. We don't walk through the library one parameter at a time. We compare each voxel with all of the entries in a non-iterative, it's, it's quite fast. And it, it doesn't leave you susceptible to finding false minimum, which, which uh, when, you, when you're doing iterative, settings you do. So here's what we find, and, and this is quite interesting. Here is, first of all, you when you make parametric maps, you actually can see the anatomy, and that's encouraging. It's not all random, which would not be encouraging. Here's the cell density map, and you see that the cell density in gray matter is less than the cell density in white matter. Conversely, this is the average cell volume map, the volume in gray matter is larger than the volume in white matter. And here's the KIO map, the KIO in gray matter is less than the KIO in white matter. Um, you can appeal to histology um, and to pathology um, to um, validate that. Here's a postmortem brain study and I'm not going to go through all, there, there are lots of issues about errors in pathology estimation, but what it confirms is that the, the um, cell density in the gray matter should be less than the cell density in white matter, and but the average volume of cells in gray matter should be greater than those in white matter. And that's because the neurons, the neuron cell bodies are in the gray matter. And they're they're typically larger cells, and and so that's that's what we find. I'll show you all the time we find. So that's pretty interesting. And then the question is, what about this KIO? This is the first time it's been possible to measure KIO in the normal brain, because you can't do it with contrast agents because of the blood-brain barrier. And it says the contract, the KIO in the white matter is a little bit greater than in the gray matter. And if uh, you were, if I, if I had given you time to pay attention to that earlier equation that related KIO to the metabolic activity of the pump, you would have also noticed it's inversely proportional to the volume of the cell. Well, what if? This KIO is larger only because in the gray and white matter, only because the average cell volume is smaller. If that was true, that would be pretty disappointing that it's just a sophisticated way to measure the, um, the cell volume, which we're also getting as a MADI parameter. And so what we did is move, uh, move the volume over to the left-hand side and also the concentration of water inside cells, which is just a constant. Um, and the, so the KIOV product is a water volume efflux, um, picoliters per cell, per second per cell. And when we did that, we saw that in fact, uh, the, these KIOV product would multiply by 0.042. Uh, are not constant. 
And so that means this is not reflecting just the cell volume chain, that this really, it's greater in gray matter. KIOV is greater in gray matter than white matter, even though KIO is greater in white matter than gray matter. And in fact, this uh, made sense from the literature because if we made a parametric map of the KIOV product multiplied by 0 .4, 0 0.042, it looks very much like a modern PET image of the brain, which is measuring the metabolic rate of glucose consumption. It's higher in the gray matter, the cortex and the internal gray matter structure than in the white matter. And that's, that's what we're seeing. So this was encouraging that we actually were measuring some ongoing uh, metabolic activity without having to have a cyclotron or a hot lab uh, or an injection period. No pharmacokinetics involved at all. This is steady state uh, water uh, exchange. And so then we proceeded to take some careful quantitative PET there aren't a lot of quantitative FDG PET studies, but this measures, uh, is one paper that did, and measures the metabolic rate of glucose consumption on this axis. And this is what we purport to be the metabolic rate of the pump multiplied by X. And you see a very strong correlation in the gray matter structures between uh, the MRI measurement and the PET measurement. And, and you see a qualitative agreement here and you see a quantitative agreement here. And that makes sense if you recognize that one of the main functions of glucose is to produce ATP either by glycolysis or big time to produce uh, uh, ATP by oxidative phosphorylation. But if the concentration of ATP is constant in steady state, uh, in portions of the brain where there are more glucose taken up, there should be more pump activity because the pump is the, like the main customer for the ATP and, it, and it's consuming the ATP. So you have to have a consumption of ATP matching the, the production of ATP. And that's why in gray matter, you see this is all going faster and in white matter, it's, it's going slower. So, so we proceeded, this is that first subject. Um, here is a second human subject. Turns out everybody working on this likes their own color scales and the color scales are all different, but the units are all the same. The cell densities are in 100,000 cells per microliter. The volumes are in picoliters per cells. KIO is reciprocal seconds. KIOV is picoliters per second per cell. Um, and ADC is an ADC map here. Uh, so they're really very similar. And if we, and we're working right now to put them all on the same color scale, you see about the same, the same trend. And there's a, a control rat here, an esthetized rat. This is an awake resting human. This is a resting human and an esthetized control rat. But we always see the same thing. The cell density in gray matter is less than white matter. The cell volume in gray matter is greater than uh, white matter in KIO. Uh, th those relationships are all the same. So then we decided to study a rat model of glioblastoma. And so we, we could uh, inject uh, uh, RG2 glioblastoma cells and wait 10 days. And you see a, a, a clear tumor develop in the ADC map. And of course, what you see, this is a combined MRI PET, uh, uh, MADI PET study. The, the glucose uptake in the tumor goes up considerably. And this has been, this is the major finding of FDG PET for cancer. Uh, FDG PET uptake increases in tumor, in malignant tumors. And instead of, being correlated with it like it was in the normal brain, the KIOV uh, in, in the tumor is gone down, not up. 
And we, we thought about that for a while, but not very long because we realized there is this famous metabolic switch. Um, here is uh, this wonderful figure from Thomas Seyfried's group. This is a normal tissue. The glucose is making ATP by glycolysis, and then it makes it big time when the pyruvate gets into the mitochondrion and uses oxygen, and you can get 30 to 36 ATPs per glucose from oxidative phosphorylation, and you only get two ATPs per glucose from glycolysis. But in two, and and the and the PET world, FDG PET world knows the metabolic rate of glucose uptake or consumption doubles in a tumor. Everybody knows it's roughly two times larger. And so that's the case for a glioma. But the mitochondria work in a very different way. There's been a metabolic switch. In fact, in this picture, the mitochondria even works backwards and consumes ADP. It doesn't make it. And that's often kind of what people call the Warburg state. And if you go through a calculation, even though the glucose uptake is doubling, the amount of ATP per glucose per unit time has dropped about 94%. And, and that's what we see it, with K, KIOV because we're measuring something that's the, the consumption of the ATP by the pump, which is way downstream. The rate limiting step for FDG PET is the, uh, like, is the phosphorylation of the glucose. All of this other stuff happens after the rate limiting step and PET can't see that. And, and we do see that. And so if we take the whole cohort of rats that we studied and we plot the, this water efflux, KIOV, times the PET uh, um, glucose consumption. Here's the normal control rat brain. Here are the tumor rats. So although SUV tumor, uh, the uptake of uh, FDG really increases a lot, the KIOV decreases. Here's you have the positive correlation in the normal brain. You have a very negative correlation in, in the tumor. And then if we do therapy, temozolomide, then we reverse most of that. Uh, the, the, the uptake of glucose, uptake of glucose by PET gets large, uh, gets smaller, and the KIOV increases. So we think we, we can see with a higher resolution because we can see inside the tumor, and that's very important, PET can never see inside the tumor, um, uh, and, and with no injection of, of anything, all of this. And so here's a very busy slide, but it's been known for many years that in human glioma, the tissue concentration of ATP goes down by phosphorus 31 uh, MRS. MRS but the sodium concentration goes up by sodium MRS. And that's an indication, but, but a poor resolution, and these are all single voxel kind of studies, um, that the pump activity has gone down. And that's what we see. And the real clincher is a paper that just appeared early this year from the Rubinovitz uh, group at, at Princeton and the um, Van der Heiden group at MIT, where they do isotope, isotopomeric carbon-13 MR pharmacokinetic uh, pharmacodynamic analyses of mouse tissue, and they do a metabolic uh, met metabolomic analysis with freeze quench and liquid chromatography and mass spectroscopy. And they, this paper, we already had our rat data when this paper appeared in January, and they find exactly what we see. Here's a healthy pancreas and the cancer, and this is the metabolic rate of ATP synthesis. So, so they, they're not doing metabolic rate of glucose consumption. They're using all of this complicated work 
to get the metabolic rate of ATP synthesis. And it's way down in the pancreatic tumor, in a colon tumor, and it's about the same amount that we see KIOV going down in those rat glioma. They also see it go down in lung cancer, not as much, but not in the spleen, which is a leukemia. So that, that may be a suggestion of a different kind of cancer metabolism. And this is just a wonderful paper because they show that generally you get glycolysis only in tumors and, and not in healthy tissues. And uh, uh, the uh, metabolic rate of ATP synthesis is smaller in tumors, and, and that's what they see. So this is kind of important because there are a few groups that are trying to measure KIO in the brain with shutter speed DC MRI, which is a problem because you can't measure KIO in the normal appearing brain. And when you do get KIO in the tumor, you're never sure if you've got enough content, contrast agent in order to measure KIO accurately and whether you're missing some because you didn't get enough contrast agent or it's actually low. This looks like our map of inside the tumor in the red brain, but they can't know um, the uncertainties. So, 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 and besides, you have to do an injection every time you want to study this. Uh, ours is totally non-invasive. Um, so it looks like, I'm going to try to close this up here quickly, that there, there really is something called active water cycling. There really is this phenomenon. And we can use it to make metabolic maps that tell us the, the sodium potassium pump activity. Here's a very interesting uh, set of results from uh, Italian groups that do, they measure glioma cell lines and breast tumor cell lines in vitro cultures, and they measure KIO by shutter speed and MR. And they say that KIO gets much bigger with the metastatic potential of different cell lines. And the same is true with the breast cancer uh, cell. But when you study them in vivo, you still get the same trend with metastatic potential but the KIOs are much reduced in vivo by, by almost uh, 90%. And the question is, is that because they're measuring KIO using a different method, they use shutter speed MRI for the cells in vitro and using fast field cycling endogenous shutter speed in, in vivo, or is it a tumor microenvironment effect, which is in cancer these days, that's a very hot issue. In other words, maybe in vivo puts you in the Warburg state and the KIO has, has uh, reduced. Uh, here's a, one study we have done on a prostate. We published it in a, a PISMERM uh, abstract uh, a couple of years ago. And it shows the same thing. It's a known Gleason 3.4 lesion here. And the, the KIO is small in the tumor and the V is small. So they're both small with the average cell volume. And so that means that the KIO V in the tumor is less than the KIO V in the normal appearing uh, prostate. And so th that suggests the same kind of result. Just a couple of uh, studies of other possible uh, Maddie being sensitive to changes in uh, activity in the brain. This is a drastic experiment that Marty Pike did with a mouse and a, a euthanasia experiment. And here's the KIOV map of the mouse uh, with, uh, with the uh, uh, general high, the live mouse pre-euthanasia, high all over the brain. Um, Here's the KIOV 17 minutes after the euthanasia in the magnet, and the signal has almost gone away completely. This is like a severe, uh, massive total stroke model, uh, which suggests that the KIOV is very sensitive to that. What about a slightly less 
invasive uh, procedure. We have a colleague here at the Imaging Center who volunteers so often, he finds it very easy to sleep in the magnet. And so we put him in the magnet for about an hour and a half session and told him to go to sleep if he could. And we make sequentially spaced uh, seven minute MADI acquisition, whole brain acquisitions. Um, I'm only gonna show you one slice. Um, and we, me we measured his heart rate. This is a very crude experiment. Um, and here's the one, two, three, four, five, six. We told him to go to sleep. His heart rate goes down, generally goes down. We woke him up before the sixth acquisition and talked to him so we know he was awake and his heart rate went up. Here are the KIOV maps. It looked like a pretty normal KIOV map for MADI 1, for MADI 4, and for MADI 6. One thing you notice is that the ventricles in this slice enlarge significantly at MADI 4 here. And that's been studied by Nettergaard's group that, in fact, when you're asleep, your ventricles do enlarge to some extent. And then when we woke him back up, the ventricles returned to the normal size. And so we decided to take some difference maps. And here's a difference map between Maddie 6, when he was awake, we, we talked to him, and Maddie 3, which he was probably pretty asleep. Uh, and so this is awake minus asleep. So it's like waking up or becoming woke in Florida. Uh, he's waking up. And what's very interesting is that there are significant changes in this map. This is a Delta uh, KIOV map. And you see a lot of increases in the cortex. What, first of all, you see some changes around the ventricles, but that's just due to the shrinking of the ventricles from the asleep state to the awake state. But in the cortex area, you see a lot of increases in KIOV. And in other regions of the brain, um, interior and maybe deeper in the brain, negative changes. And these changes are huge compared to functional MRI. This color red represents a 30% increase. And this color blue represents a 40% decrease. It's a huge change. So this is only one experiment that we've just tried and we don't know yet, but I found this really interesting paper that um, the, the, the hypothesis in this paper is that there are sleep switches in the brain. There are centers in the brain, kind of lower the, in the lower parts of the brain, near the, near the brain stem. The green spots are arousal centers. They send excitatory uh, uh, link, uh, nerves to the cortex to keep your cortex awake so you can see what's going on around you and hear what's going on around you. But there are also other centers in this, near in the same region which are sleep centers. They send inhibitory signals to the brain so that when you're asleep, you don't hear sounds, you don't see light, you, you, get, get, you get some sleep. And their hypothesis is that there's a, a combination of excitatory connections, which are green, and inhibitory connections. And when you're asleep, in the sleep state, the um, uh, sleep centers are active, but they're inhibiting um, the cortex. And then when you, is a kind of a flip-flop, like an electrical switch. And when you're aroused, when you're awake, the, this, the arousal centers uh, are active. And so they're both active, but one is doing inhibition and one is doing excitation. And so it is, it's possible that we're seeing the, the cortex wake up um, with this increased activity and the sleep centers are, have decreased in activity. And if we reverse the, the subtraction and did MADI three minus MADI six, 
then what's bright red here would get very dark and what's dark colored would get bright red there. So it's, it's an interesting uh, and tantalizing possibility that needs to be followed up. So I'll close out. About 10 years ago, my sister, this is my sister, Virginia, she gave me a t-shirt that says on the cellular level, I'm really quite busy. I thought this was probably an insult that she thinks I'm lazy. So I've done all this work to show that in fact, on a cellular level, I really am quite busy. Uh, and, and Maddie looks, looks very intriguing. There's one last question, which I won't have time to answer, but I'll give you the question. The question is, is this active water cycling a futile cycle? In biochemistry, a futile cycle is one where you have coupled reactions that consume ATP with no benefit. And probably the first time people realized that sodium was cycling and potassium was cycling, they might have thought those were futile cycles also. But of course, we now know there's a lot of thermodynamic energy stored in the sodium concentration gradient and in the potassium concentration gradient. And the, the, what, what's really going on is these cycles are storing energy in the concentration gradients. And so that's not a futile cycle. And so the question is, is the water a futile cycle, the water cycle? And I think the answer is, pro oops, wrong. Probably not. Oh, the answer is later. It's probably not, but I don't, I really don't have time to show you that. I think I've taken too much time. So let me thank people who did all this work. The main players are Greg Wilson, a, a collaborator at the University of Washington in Seattle, Brendan Maloney and Eric Baker, which are uh, outstanding computer scientists here in our imaging center. Who, who did all this Veroni cell modeling and the, the uh, uh, ensembles of them. And Shen Li and Marty Pike, who are MR scientists in our center, who have been pushing the experiments. And Marty has been doing these recent experiments with the rats and, uh, and the uh, visual and the sleep study. And many, many people over, and many institutions over many years, have contributed to the whole concept of shutter speed and active water cycling, including, of course, this hardy group at Washington University, Joe Ackerman, Joel Garbo, and Jeffrey Neal. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Charlie. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Yeah, we're having trouble with uh, interaction between the, the live stream and the Zoom. Um, I'm going to go to the live stream. I'm going to mute, mute my computer um, and read, uh, see if there are any uh, chats, uh, questions in there. So I'll get back to you in a minute. Well, Charlie, I got to tell you now on the live stream, all I get is the announcement for the upcoming, for the upcoming, uh, let's see if this, oh, here we go. All right. Well, um, 
We, well, Charlie, I got to tell you now on the live stream, all I get is the announcement for the up. Charlie, I got a uh, couple questions here. I assume you can hear me. Wave if you can hear me. Okay, great. Um, thanks a lot for the very impressive talk. Which sequence did you use to calculate exchange maps? Could you please suggest an optimal B value and exchange times the range for diffusion exchange imaging of the human brain? Um, that's a great question. Uh, we don't use a single B value. We try to collect as many B values as we can as far out as we can because it's the shape of the decay in B space that really matters here. Um, uh, it's not, it, we're not doing single B space uh, mapping like you do normally do in diffusion weighted imaging. We're me measuring the, the, the decays and then we match the decays to the library simulated decays and each one returns with a set of three parameters and then we make the map. So it's not, it's not the same as DWI. As far as the diffusion time, we haven't investigated that very much. And we suspect it's not very crucial um, because our library is made with a simulated set of uh, diffusion parameters the diffusion acquisition parameters, including the diffusion time. In our acquisition, we tried to match the acquisition on the Siemens software to the library simulation as best we could, but you can't match it exactly because these modern clinical instruments don't use, they don't use the nomenclature of st simple stench called Tanner um, diffusion parameters that you see in the research literature. And so you have to try to, to find out what their diffusion times and their, and their um, uh, um, uh, gradient strengths and, and gradient lifetimes are. So they're, they're similar, but they don't match exactly. And, and we think it, it, we may get a little bit more, a better precision if we do match those but it doesn't seem to be a major determinant. But again, I stress the important thing is we're not working at a single B value. We like to get a, a number of B values and get them out as far as we can get them with, with not too much noise because these decays in the library, they diverge at large, they all start at the same place in B space, but they diverge as they go out in B space and that's how you tell the difference between them. So th that's an important uh, under uh, the difference. Too much noise. Charlie, can you hear me? Just wave. Yeah. Great. Um, we got a, a question from uh, Fairmead out at Yale. I'll read the whole thing. He's been waiting. Uh, thanks, Charlie. Great process, process since you presented this idea at Yale in 2015. 2015. My question is with regard to definition of cellular density in this work. In the human brain, the cell number in white matter is actually three times higher than in gray matter. This is because there are lots of non-neuronal cells that have escaped the attention of past cellular taxonomy. Your math works just as well if you alter your definition of cellular density to synaptic density. With synaptic density, the gray-white matter differences you indicate are indeed what is observed with modern techniques. Thus, I propose a parsimonious solution, which is to substitute cellular with synaptic. <laughs> the rest should work out. Having said all that, need for validation with additional metabolic MR methods will be exciting to explore. I'll let you answer. <laughs> well, I, I, I agree with you. Um, the the, in, the interesting thing to me about white matter is that the diffusion people have uh, focused so long on the axons, which are are big structures that go a long way, 
And there are a gazillion more very small cells in white matter. There are oligodendrocytes, there are microglia, there are lots of astrocytes. Um, and they, for in fact, of course, make the wrapping, the myelin wrapping around the axons. That, yes, there are, you can talk about concentrations of synapses, but there really are a lot of small cells in, in white matter. And that's what that, the, the Portuguese uh, paper I showed you was finding that there was a greater cell density in, in the sense that we define it in white matter than in gray matter because of all these very small cells. So yes, that's a very good point. Uh, and obviously there are many uh, new ways to explore um, validation and comparison with what we're doing with other methods. But, but again, I stress it's totally non-invasive and we have a spatial resolution approaching that of high resolution water. So that that's, I think is very useful. Charlie, there are a couple other questions. Let me read them both and uh, you can answer them uh, together. Um, they're from Johannes Lohmeyer. What are relevant confounding factors for MADI imaging? That's question number one. And question number two, regarding the subtraction maps in sleep state, did you also compute a subtraction map between state states six and one wake and wake as control uh the six is the awake the one is not an awake uh the subject afterwards reported he fell asleep as soon as he started so it, it, yes we ha we have not yet made the six minus one although i've asked for it but it's the six is the control because we talked to the it's the awake state as we talk to the subject. Um, uh, the confounding errors, well, I, I'm not sure. Uh, there, there, are, there are certainly errors. It's a question of precision. And that's the question of the inverse problem. Um, how unique is the match that, that the, soft, the matching program returns from the library? Um, there, there is a question, there is an issue of the noise in the B space decay. And, and the noise gets greater as you get to larger Bs where the discrimination of the different simulated curves is greater. So uh, we are working and, and talking about ways to reduce the noise, not the noise in the image. And there's a lot of denoising papers in the literature for denoising DWI images. We need to denoise the B space decays. And I think there may be ways of doing that, which would then uh, increase um, the precision. And I, and I hope it might sharpen up the uh, gray matter maps a bit, but, but we'll see about that. But it's, it's obvious. I think in our paper that we published uh, in January, we listed 10 different steps to try to improve Maddie, and so we're working on those steps. Step to try to improve Maddie, and so we're working on those Charlie, steps. how... Uh... I think that's all the questions. I have a bunch of questions, but this is so awkward. Um, we'll reserve those uh, for later. Um, you can hear me, I hope, Wave? Yes, I hear you. Yeah, hear you. yeah this is very enjoyable uh, and great talk. And clearly, you got a lot of interest out there. I think that's all the questions. I have a bunch of questions, but this is so. I'm like, good Lord. Okay. 
Um, I think we're there, Charlie. Uh, thank you very much. That was that was terrific. And there is a recording of this um, that I believe will be posted on the WMIS um, website uh, for viewing by the I, uh, Imaging Data Science Interest Group. Great. Uh, so I thank everybody for putting up with uh, the uh, technical difficulties. We will straighten this out at some point, maybe not in my lifetime, but it will get straightened out. Uh, and again, Charlie, great to see you. And thank you very much uh, for that terrific piece of work. So. Thank you.